Welcome to the Alpha Pickleball Podcast, where we slice through the noise to bring you the juiciest insights, strategies, and stories from the dynamic world of pickleball. Join us as we serve up engaging conversations with top players, coaches, and enthusiasts, giving you an ace perspective on all things pickleball. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just stepping onto the court, get ready for a volley of knowledge that'll elevate your game to alpha levels. Let the rallies begin. All right. Welcome again to the show. I'm your host, Tats. Uh, today's guest is uh, the one and only Lee Whitwell, uh, pro pickleball player, college uh, champ, college, college tennis champ. Lee, thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. Oh, my pleasure. I, um, I will say Charles bribed me and I won't tell you what he sent me in the mail. No, I'm kidding. It's my pleasure to be here. <laughs> Yeah, no, you, we were just talking about because uh, last day Charles was beating up on me with this, you know, fast shots and, you know, fancy spins. And you were giving me some tips uh, on Charles or anyone um, on, on how to possibly get at them. Absolutely. But full disclaimer, and um, like whatever tips I give and anybody who takes this to heart and tries it out. You are not allowed to use it on me when you play me. Like that is the only thing that that's my rule. Like I'll make I'll help make you better. I'll give you some tips, but if you use it against me, you just declared war. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Okay, signed, signed and sealed. Signed and sealed. Excellent. No, we're talking about um, you know, speeding up at the person at the net, and sometimes their reflexes are um they're there or they're reading your shots and in one shot it's not exactly the most sportsmanlike but very effective is speeding it up as if you would hit a drive in tennis but you're hitting it from the from the non-volley kitchen line right so you're hitting a very very hard shot you have to be extremely precise and you're aiming pretty much at center mass now most people when they play pickleball when they get when they leave a ball they tend to move one way or the other. They'll either they'll, they'll either turn to the left to leave it or turn to the right. They're not very good at moving both ways. They typically keep one pattern. For me, I'm left-handed. I tend to pull to my left. Don't ask why, it just happens. So if you pick up on that, then the speed up becomes more to their left, right? More to their left chest because now they're going to turn into the ball. Whereas if you went to their right, they're getting out of the way of the ball. So you just have to pick up on things like that and then be very, very good at target practice. Wow. Uh, I mean, at a, after a certain level, doesn't sort of, you know, uh, you said, you know, sportsmanship or, you know, sort of fair, you know, everything is fair. At what level does everything become fair? Fair um, game. At pro I level, think, of course. You know, yeah, everything is fair game, I think, when you've got a level playing field. Um, like, I wouldn't suggest you going down to the courts this afternoon and you know, trying that against 75-year-old Betty, who's a 2-5 and new to the game. You know, they might, you know, look at you a little different. But I think when the level field is, is when the when the playing field is level, then you can, it's, it, you're all on equal footing. Um, so that way it's, you know, if you misdirect the ball on me and I don't see it coming and we're the same level, I, I, I wasn't paying attention. I checked out for a minute and then you were able to sneak something in. Right. And as, as, as you get better and pickleball and you play better and better people, um, you, you'll realize that the court is slow. It's, it's not as slow. The court is short, right. And narrow. And there's, there's not a lot of room. Like in tennis, we practice passing shots, right. I can pass you down the line. I can pass you cross court and pickleball. Yes, you can pass somebody, but the court is very small. So if you've got two people on the court, you know, they can pretty much cover the court like this together. Yes. And so I feel for that so many times, the illusion of the open court, but all they need to do is poke it at you and you get smoked. 100%. It's just one step and bam, right? So then if that's not going to work, then now I've got to jam you up here, right? Then the goal isn't, I mean, the goal really is not to hit the person. And if you do, well, you know, you do. But the goal is to get them jammed or to get them, up here so that the ball comes up and then you've got the next shot which is easy right and you're pushing them back so yeah. you know going at the person is a much more effective strategy in pickleball than, than potentially in tennis right yeah for sure now you you know had a very successful college tennis career 
Um, how did pickleball come into the picture? Um, there was a huge gap between, you know, my tennis, college tennis was the late 1900s, long, long time ago. Um, you know, almost pre-internet. And then <laughs> um, there was a gap in there between, I played for tennis for a bit. And then um, when I was in Bend, Oregon, I just moved to Bend, Oregon. And a friend of mine said, hey, do you want to play in a tournament with me? I said, sure. And and she's like, it's not tennis. I'm like, well, why, why are you asking me to play something that's not tennis? I'm like, is it volleyball? Because I played college volleyball as well. I'm like, yeah, I love yeah. volleyball. Right. And she's like, no, 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 it's pickleball. I'm like, I'm never going to play pickleball. My, you know, why would I play a sport my grandma would play? It's loud, it's obnoxious, the scoring doesn't make sense. And, and this is everything I'd heard about pickleball. I had never seen pickleball being played. These were all preconceived notion, notions I'd heard that I took them as gospel. And I'm like, nope, not doing it. So we went back and forth for a while and she's like, it's gonna be so much fun. I'm like, that's great. Yes, no, not playing. Um, and then, you know, after about 20 minutes, she's like, fine, I'll buy you a case of beer. And I'm like, why didn't you just leave with that? I would have <laughs> told you yes in a heartbeat. So, you know, it's no, it's no, uh, it's no mystery that a case of beer got me into pickleball and played in a tournament, had an absolute blast. And, you know, it's been, I haven't looked back since. So I was hooked the first time I played. I didn't know the rules. I kept falling into the kitchen. You know, I'd serve in volley. I'd do whatever. I'd score however I wanted. The ref was like, you can't do that. I'm like, well, yes, I can. He's like, no, you can't. There's actually rules. Um, <laughs> so it was, um, but such a blast. And what struck me was more than I was having fun competing again, you know, later in life. Um, but it was also the sense of community and, and the people and how not, I mean, how friendly everybody was, but also just how everybody was just there watching. And I don't know, it was just this cool little glimpse into something special and something that I wanted to be a part of. Yeah, for sure. Now, early, I, I one of the podcasts I listened to as you're, you know, I think, transitioning from pickleball and one of the things you described dinking was a drop shot and I thought that was kind of cool because you know dinking is one of the things that tennis players really struggle with and you know I'm, I'm always trying to get better at it but um yeah I mean what are other things you you, you teach you know people that play tennis to just try to come over and you know have a pickleball brain so it, yeah, it's it's interesting because you know having come from tennis and and you know tennis being my first love and I was like that's it I'm a tennis purist through and through realize I'm a big fat liar because I'm not because I'm now in pickleball, um, but you, you as tennis players we tend to function in the I shoulds because think about how many lessons you took in tennis you know learning topspin learning slice learning every you know kick serve slice serve flat serve you name it everything all the different grips the the technique. And the, the nuances within the technique in, in, in two degrees of a paddle face angle makes such a big difference, right? And then you, you watch pickleball and pickleball on TV looks basic compared to tennis. So as tennis players, we function in the I shoulds. I should be able to do this. I play tennis. I, you know, I've done more complicated things. And, we, and we, we, we focus so much on the I shoulds that we don't embrace the differences of the game. And it, pickleball is a very easy game to learn but very hard to master. And so when you start embracing those differences and looking at it as its own sport, not as a comparison to the sport you come from, and you see it as its own sport, then you can, now you can grow. But while you're still in the back of your mind comparing it to your sport, you've put a, you've put a ceiling on your ability to grow because you function in, in, in the negative emotion, which is the I should, instead of, okay, it's a different sport, there are a lot of similarities, but, you know, I'm going to have to hit potentially 45 drop shots, right? Versus a drop shot in tennis is a winner or the next ball after that's the winner, right? Yeah. Um, sure. So it's, it, it's, it's really unraveling your mindset and, and understanding that your athletic brain that got you to where you got to in tennis yeah. can yeah. really help you in your growth and pickleball, but you've got to completely separate the two sports. Yeah, makes sense. Now, stylistically, there's so many different ways people play pickleball. For you, how did you develop your style? Um, trial and error. <laughs> 
Um, obviously, you know, you come in from the baseline and you can use your, your, you know, I always say from a, a tennis player's, you know, biggest strength is going to be on your serves and returns in a driving third ball, right? A ball that you can really step in on and drive because that's very, very similar to tennis. Yeah, you're, you're not, you know, you're not going um, over the mountain and through the tunnel so big, right? It's a smaller compact swing, but the mechanics are pretty much the same. With the grit on the paddle, you can do topspin, you can really manipulate the ball. And then as you're moving in, everything needs to be more and more compact, right? And... I was lucky in the sense when I started playing tennis a long, long, long time ago, um, volleys were very, very important to the game. And we were taught to hit very compact volleys, right? Not so much the big swinging volleys you see now, but very, very compact. So I came into the game with compact strokes moving forward, but a lot of it is, is like, okay, how can I add spin to this? How can I add top spin without taking a back swing, without getting your, your shoulders and hips over rotating a telegraphing and b you know over following through so that you're exposed in the next ball um and that is just a lot of uh, you know a lot of trial and error figuring out what works and how you can best prepare for your next shot and did i get hit a lot in that process 100 percent. but you almost need to get hit to be kept honest so that you can figure out well that didn't work let's tweak it and do this okay that works better but what what is more effective and, and honestly, it's, it's the way, the way I teach pickleball now is very much in the, um, it's very much a pushing sport to me, pushing and shoving, not a swinging sport, right? Especially transition, transition zone forward. So think of it as when you close a kitchen drawer, right? Your hand goes to the drawer and you push forward. You don't come from back here and push, right? When you close a door, you're not coming from out here and slapping the door, right? You just meet it where it's at and then push. And that's what we need to do in pickleball. And the more we focus on the in front of us motion, and it's like, am I seeing my paddle in front of me at all times? Now I can just push and push. You're, if you're hitting the ball hard, you're creating the energy. I just have to meet your energy and push back, right? And I can soften that or I can add to it. And it's, and it's really trusting that your feet are in the right position as much as possible, because if they're in the right position, now you can push effectively. Yeah. Right. Think of like a bump in volleyball when they're, when they're passing the ball, right? When your feet are in the right position, you can pass the ball properly, you know, and that's the, you know, you have your feet are squared up to the ball and you, your weight's going forward. That's sort of the mentality you want to get in when you're, when you're playing pickleball, not the crossover footwork like we do on our backhands a lot of the times in tennis, where the minute we, 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 cause we lead with our, we lead with our racket because that should, that unit turn comes first and then the leg follows and now we cross over. Where in pickleball is there's no unit turn. There's where's the ball? Is it on my right hand side? Then that left that right leg goes first. If it's on my left, my left leg goes first. And undoing those patterns, which are really, really hard to do because you've had those patterns for how long, you know? And you you know, and I still catch myself doing that, but it's 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 just recognizing those and, and really being diligent and drilling. Yeah, absolutely. And so there's something else, uh, you know, besides the tennis background we share is just I'm a lefty. And so are you. Now, I was talking to some very experienced pickleball player locally, and, and I was trying to learn the lefty position better, and he expressed a lot of frustration over being a lefty. I'm wondering if you share that, or do you have more positive things to say about being, being a lefty and playing lefty? I love being a lefty. I love playing lefty. I hate playing lefties. Because <laughs> it's very rude, because they are able to hit the ball in places that it doesn't occur to a righty to do sometimes. Um, it, there's, I mean, I, I'm not frustrated. I don't, I'm not really frustrated when I'm on lefty. It's, it's hard. It's, you know, you have to stack a lot. You want your forehand in the middle. Um, two backhands in the middle is a little bit problematic because of reach and, 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 and court coverage. Um, although I've played a lot on the left when I've had a lefty partner. And it's been interesting, the response when two lefties play together. Mm. And, you know, they're like, well, we didn't know what to do. And I'm like, what do you mean? It's the same game. But the th it's, and, and you have to realize, it's like, if you think about it, we practice against righties 99% of the time. Righties practice against righties 99% of the time. <laughs> so a lefty is like, now they're, you know, you've got to reverse targets. And a lot of times people say that lefties, you know, they've got really quick hands and they can block and reset really, really well. Not really, because the speed up against the righty is the right hip. 
But if you don't realize that the left is there and muscle memory takes over, you're going to speed up to the right hip, but that's feeding right into their back end. Right? So you've just made them look fast, but we won't tell the righties that, okay? That's our secret. Um, <laughs> I know, because Ben no, John so... mentioned that the future of dub doubles will be a lefty-righty combo. Do you agree with that? I do. I think a lefty-righty combo with one of the two being slightly more alpha than the other. Okay. Um, Which one? Is it still tra traditionally you're saying the, the left side is, is that or does it matter? I don't think it matters. However, I will say that when you've got a lefty-righty combo, your righty person's on the left-hand side, right? Yeah. Now in front of them, they have a backhand in the middle. So I would say that left-sided player would need to be a little bit more alpha there because that's, that is going to be able to be a little bit more vulnerable and you can attack and you can jam that person a little bit more, right? Whereas on the other side, that person's sitting for Um, I mean, that's the only thing I see. In, but honestly, I think it's going to be a tactical game of who can figure out who's in front of them, which way do they sit? Do they sit slightly more backhand, slightly more forehand, and then do the right speed ups? And that's going to start the, the point leaning the way of the aggressor, so to speak. Yeah, for sure. Now, um, how has your game evolved from when you first started? I think you just talked about volleys a bit, but till it is now. Um, it's quite a bit because I mean, I, I started playing when the paddles were really, really smooth. So everything there wasn't, you, you could slice the ball a little bit, but it didn't grip, right? Topspin didn't go anywhere. So it was very flat um and very more hammer to nail right when you're hitting the ball um and as the surfaces have changed and gotten grittier and you know you've gone you know you, you've got carbon fiber you've got thermoform you've got now the paddle technology has gone off the charts in a, in a into a land that is way beyond my level of comprehension of chemistry um you're able to do more with the ball like i can you know i can hit a ball with a semi-western grab i could never do that before you know, to, to think that now I can do something with a semi-western grip is insane. And now that you can change grips, like for example, in tennis, I had one grip, I played doubles mainly, right? My serve, my return, my volleys, they were overheads, all the same grip, right? Because I chipped and charged, I came in, I wanted to just volley, do everything, one grip, and I didn't have to think. Um, in pickleball, I have about six different grips, oh, really? depending on the ball, right? If I'm at the net and I can get that ball in the air, in, in the air, I'm going to change grip to, into my back and to be able to roll it or the other way to be able to roll a forehand. Yeah. Right. So you're and able those, to make those decisions. Did those grips naturally happen? Or was it just a deliberate attempt to just practice that shot selection? Um, a combination of both, I would say. I'd say because the minute you start taking the ball in the air and wanting to do stuff with the ball, it's like, well, with this grip, I can't really come over the top of the ball just as a function of my wrist movement, the way I'm holding it, I can't. If I'm slightly more forehand, rolling it on that backhand with a wrist that won't, you know, that the angle of the paddle doesn't make sense. So you gotta, you gotta change it. Yeah. Um, and you've gotta be okay doing that. And also now the, the, the bigger issue is your ball recognition has gotta be spot on because you've got a split second to make those changes. Got it. And for you, like the switching between those thoughts, did it, was it easier? Because I just find sometimes information overload and probably just newer to it uh, with all the things that you can do. How do you kind of, if you were teaching someone, how do you kind of talk through pacing? Um, if I were teaching somebody, I would take them with a very, very neutral grip, right? And if they come from a tennis background, I'll allow them to change their grip at the baseline a little bit. But once they come into transition, it's very, very neutral. Like my, my grip coming through transition is very, very neutral. It's going to be extremely neutral till I get to that line. And I and, and that point now is neutralized. And that point essentially started over, right? We've taken the advantage away from the returning team. And now we're all at the kitchen line. And that's where the point starts, so to speak. Yeah. And now you can start to get creative, yeah. right? Coming in through that transition zone is one grip. If I've got too many grips, who knows what's going to happen. But I would teach somebody to have a very, very neutral grip. And once they've mastered all of that, then it's like, okay, when the pat, when the ball is up here, you know, with this grip, these are your options. If yeah. you turned it slightly, you can add this. Yeah. 
right? But you can't do this unless you recognize that that ball's coming up high at you or, you know, chest heights or so that you can do that, right? So the, the, the ball recognition piece, I guess, is the hardest thing to teach because it needs to be a proactive decision to roll that ball versus a reactive decision. Yeah. And is that sort of, you know, you're thinking about it and you're playing a game or do you drill it that way where someone kind of like isolates that and gives you high and low balls or like how, how, what's the most effective way to get your brain to settle in on that? The ball machine is your best friend, you know, and you drill it and drill it. Or if you have a drilling partner, you drill and drill and drill and drill and you work on stuff, work on stuff, work on stuff, which I think is the biggest piece that's missing in people's progression of pickleball. They'll take a lesson and then they'll go play. Well, it didn't work. Lee. Well, did you practice? Well, no, I took a lesson and then I went to play. Well, you didn't, you, you've missed like five steps. Like, you know, there's, you know, it's like, it's, I've had people ask me like, can we get a, I'm playing in a tournament Friday. Lee. Can I get a lesson Thursday? Like, no, I'm not giving you a lesson on Thursday. Like, there's no, you, there's no way you can compute any of that and, and, and implement it for Friday. Yeah. Like, I'm going to do more harm than good. Um, yeah. But, but a lot of it is, 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 is drilling. And that's where I think the stop gap happens for people is they, they, they forget to drill or they don't put as much importance in drilling as they do playing. Now, there's two kinds of players. You've got your rec player and you've got your competitive tournament player, right? If you're a competitive tournament player, please drill. Please drill, 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 drill 80% of the week, play 20% of the week. If you're a rec player, flip the number. If you're out there to have fun, drill 20% of the time, play 80% of the time. You're there for friends. You're there for the community. You're there for the byproduct of of pickleball, which is this big backyard space where you belong and you're a part of, right? That is the community you're a part of. Yeah. You don't need to drill 80% of the time. You're there for a very different reason. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Um, just out of my curiosity, when you talk about group change, I'm thinking Eastern forehand, maybe an Eastern backhand flip for high balls, and then maybe the outside wings where you're more extreme and you're reaching, you flip it, you flip it over. To, to get a bit more dominant position is that am I getting warm with that you're definitely getting warm absolutely and a bit of, and a lot of it is 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 what's what's comfortable right and and how can you because I mean think about with topspin right when they say you know low to high well what does low to high mean it means that that front edge of the racket needs to be below the ball in tennis right you're going to create topspin same rules apply in pick a ball that front edge if you're going to if you're going to roll the ball that front edge has to start below the ball because if you don't, you're going to suffocate it. The ball is going to go nowhere. Right. And it's like, what grip works for that out here? You know, the further out you go, you know, that the longer you extend that lever, it's, you don't want to over roll because your wrist is going to collapse. So it's more of a, it's, it's more of a, like a, a semi flat, semi roll, semi roll ball. Right. But it's, you're still coming over the ball and, and, and you're just experimenting with what works for you and what is comfortable um if you have a two-handed backhand you know what works for you on that side if it's a one-handed what works and and just being able to experiment and, and have fun with it and, and and embrace the screw-ups because that's where the learning happens so how do you know you're on to something like is, is it just a comfort level um is it a pre precision or you know consistency level that kind of emerges how do you know you're on, you try 10 things. How do you know you're on the right track of, of any of them? Um, I mean, they've got to feel comfortable, right? And, and you can drill something on a ball machine and then you got a live person in front of you and you try it on them. You're like, what works? What doesn't work? Oh, did that get that response? If I try it against two or three other people, am I getting the same response back? Am I get, you know, what ball am I getting back? It's, you know, it's like, think about it. If you hit a kick serve out wide to someone's backhand, you know, we can predict the return that's coming, right? And, and, and that's, that's what you're trying to do in pickleball too. It's like, if I do this, I want this back because I'm going to do A to do B to do C, mm. you know? And, and, and it's the same philosophy we're taught in tennis. It's, it's not, you know, C ball, hit ball. It's, I want to do this with this ball because I want to, this is the shot I want to get so yeah. I can do this, right? And then, then that's what you're looking for in pickleball. If I get this roll and I'm, I'm rolling the ball cross court at an angle, you know, just past their their right foot wide, I want that ball to be able to come back maybe more middle so I can do something or I'm setting my partner up in front because they're going to bump it to them. Right. So you're, you're sort of looking for those things versus, oh, thank goodness I got the ball over. 
All right, and they couldn't attack it. Okay, job done. Like we gotta, we gotta think beyond that. We now we gotta be. That's that's very reactive play. Um, and we, we need to not be in hold your breath kind of play, but more in proactive and, and risk taking. And if it's the right shot, it's the right shot. You may have executed it incorrectly, but that doesn't mean that was the wrong shot. And that, that mistake's okay, because we can learn from that mistake. You missing a ball, not knowing how you were going to get that ball over or what you were doing. That's a hard mistake to learn from, because if you don't know what you were doing, then how do we make that better? Yeah. Right. But it's the ones where you're in control and you're recognizing, I want to roll it. Why did it go on the net? Well, maybe you weren't below the ball or maybe you came over it too fast, too hard and, and pulled down on your follow through instead of staying out here. Those are things we can fix, but the direction of that ball and the shot that you were hitting was the correct shot. Got it. And you just have to stomach the initial kind of failure that comes along with trying to, trying to uh, create that reliability. Well, and, and think about it. I mean, like but how old were you when you first started playing tennis? I started late in my teens, but I mean, I, lots of, lots of, uh, face plants. Lots of, but, but, but even in your teens, right. Think teens downwards, right. You, it, you're in an environment where it's okay to make mistakes. You, you're, you laugh at yourself. You, you know, self-conscious, you're not as self-conscious as you are as an adult. Oh. We don't want to fail. We put these restrictions on ourselves and we forget that anything we learned, any sport we learned as a young kid, we failed a million times. But the environment we're in promoted that because that's how you learn. As an adult, we're not creating that environment that makes it okay for you to fail. And then we put our own preconceived notions and the I shoulds on our on pressure on our shoulders and we make it even worse and we compound that. So it's 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 our own fault, really, because you know, it's like well, what what what's his name said in um oh what was it Peter Pan, never grow up? Oh. Right. We did. We, we grew up. And we, unfortunately, by growing up, we come in with, you know, we're self-conscious. We, we fo focus on the I should because it looks simple and we don't want to fail and we want to be perfect right out the gate. When we're learning a new skill. Like that's way too much pressure for ourselves. That's true. That makes a lot of sense. Now, speaking of pressure, when you play tournaments, more pressure than rec, how do you prepare? I pray a lot and go to mcdonald's mcdonald's no. <laughs> no, no 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 um it's you know you do the work it's nerves are good i am a big fan of nerves the day you don't have nerves is the day you're cocky and your confidence level switches to cockiness and you're going to get your butt kicked you are going to lose right nerves are good butterflies are good however there's two to me there's two different kinds of butterflies there's the butterflies of i'm excited to compete this is nerve-wracking but I've done the work. And once you start hitting a few balls, you settle in and you always rely on the fact that I've drilled, I've put in the work, I've worked every shot and pattern ad nauseum. And now I'm coming into this event fully prepared, right? All I'm, I, I'm just gonna fight to the death. And if it goes my way, great. And if it doesn't, I can go back to the drawing board, see what worked, what didn't work and make improvements, make adjustments. The other kind of nerves are the nerves where it's like you're going in there and you haven't done the work. And that's when pressure is going to get you. That one at 10, 9, you're going to crumble. Or at 8, 8, you're going to crumble. Um, the ones where you're beating a team that you maybe shouldn't be beating. And those thoughts creep into you. And then you're like, it get the, the wind gets away from you because you don't have that belief because you haven't really done the work. Right? And the work is not only the physical on court, it's also the mental talk and the positive self-talk that comes, comes with it versus, Oh my God, I can't believe I'm winning. I shouldn't be here. I can't believe that, you know, I have a two point lead or I have a three point lead, you know? And then, you know, you come off the court, you're like, Hey, how did it go? Oh man, I was up eight, five, couldn't close it out. Or we were up 10, seven, couldn't close it out. Right. We were right there. Should have closed it out. And you hear that all the time. And that to me is a sign of you didn't believe in yourself. And why didn't you believe in, didn't believe in yourself? Cause you didn't do the work on court and up here in the noggin. Oh, well said. What's the future for you? Um, pickleball, unless a crazy new sport comes along that I get bribed into playing. <laughs> so you mean um, you're, you're a pack of beer away for your next adventure? Exactly. I'm like, if anybody wants me to try a sport, just, uh, you know, a case of beer and I'm in. Except like not, 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 not rock climbing or anything to do with heights. Like me and heights don't have a very fun relationship. Um... You know, um, I get to play senior pickleball next year. 
So I'm the young buck on campus, which is nice because up until then I've been running around the court and people 30 years plus younger than me. Yes. And it's very rude because I hit a good shot and they run to it like nothing. And then they do it again <laughs> and again. And I'm like, that's just incredibly rude of you to do that. Um, so no, I'm looking forward to playing some senior pickleball, looking forward to commentating, coaching. Um, I'm one of the next gen coaches for the for next year. So um, looking forward to, to getting on the court with the young ones and, and helping them in their career. Um, I feel very, very blessed that, I mean, do I wish I was in my early 20s right now discovering pickleball? 100%, you know, because pickleball is at a point now where it, it's a legitimate career. You know, when I discovered pickleball, it wasn't, and it's slowly transitioning to that. And now I'm at the end of it, but I'm looking forward to help shape that next generation and really be a coach and mentor and, and hopefully, you know, good influence on, on the next generation of pickleball, as well as growing the grassroots community stuff, because that's where the magic is happening. That is where you see people, you know, name a sport that's transcended every barrier there is. And I'm not even barrier, but it's like age, sex, religion, white collar, blue collar, Democrat, Republican, you know, old, yeah, you name it. It's like you go to the pickleball courts and you see everybody there and you don't know who's on the court next to you or with you playing. And it's this cool backyard where people, they're networking, they're making friendships, they're developing different groups. You know, it's a place where they belong and it taps into the human basic condition with just to feel a part of something, you know, and that is special. And, and, and I, I don't want, I don't want that to go away. Yeah, absolutely. Is there anything that I did not ask you, but you want to share? How to beat Charles. You did not ask me how to beat Charles. <laughs> well, we'll do that off air. <laughs> well, Stay thank tuned. you so much, Lee. No, this is a perfect ending. You're like, so this is how you beat Charles. Beep. And then, you know, people are like, wait. And Charles is like, wait, how did you beat me? I'm like, well. <laughs> no, I, uh, I think you pretty much covered everything. It's been very enjoyable. I can't wait to get on the court with you. Yeah, it'd be fun. I mean, I you, you're gonna kick my butt, but I'm gonna I'm gonna learn a lot. I think I'll be in uh, Sacramento in March. Should be. Hopefully, that's not too too far from you. Well, I'm in, I'm in Vancouver, BC, but uh, oh, you're you're but in Vancouver, I, I BC used to right now. Play in San Francisco, yeah. So okay, but we uh, we will find a way. I would love to. So you're not too far from Washington. Uh, yeah, not too far from Washington. Yeah, I have to do it. I know. I um, a friend of mine's opening a club in Portland. Ooh, very nice. Next year, so yeah, it's it. hopefully end of January, February. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in to the Alpha Pickleball Podcast with Tats. If you enjoyed today's episode, subscribe, rate, and connect with us on social media. Stay alpha on the pickleball court until our next session.